So back for part two of inference introduction. So I just wanted to start off going back to slide 11 to remind you of the six steps on a hypothesis test because we're going to actually go through some examples on doing these six tests or six steps of a hypothesis test. Null and alternative hypothesis, choosing your test and significance level, which includes alpha, the significance level, and how many tails. Gathering your data, a random sample. Finding the rejection regions based on alpha and the number of tests, the type of test, and calculating that test statistic. And then finally, writing your conclusion. So I'm going to slip from here down to slide 25, which is where we left off before, which were the assumptions of the test. So the first two assumptions that I have a random sample, so it's representative, and that the standard deviation of the sample population is equal to the comparison population, um, those two assumptions are not testable directly. Um, you need to do everything in your power to make sure that those are the case, but statistically you can neither test nor correct for violations of those first two assumptions. The third assumption of normality, that is something we can test, and um, if we have a large sample, like over 30-ish, um, in that ballpark, usually this is not a terrible um, one to violate. Um, the test, a, Z, a one sample Z test is pretty robust to violations of normality. But um, let's go to an example. And before we hit that example, I wanna go over just some bullet points on writing up your results APA style. So we are going on the uh, seventh edition of APA's manual. And it says that we should always, and this is good advice in general, even if you're not following APA, is you should always state your alpha significance level and the number of tests. That information belongs in your methods section. So in most thesis, dissertation, manuscripts, we usually have a methods section that lays out what test we're running, and that includes out what our significance level alpha is being used and how many tails we're using. So that information belongs in the methods section. Then the results section, you have the actual results of the test and that you said you were gonna run in the methods section. So anytime you're writing a sentence, if you're gonna talk about the mean or standard deviation, if it's within the sentence, you need to write out the words, all the letters in the word mean or standard deviation. But if you have a t those values um, denoted in a table, a figure, or in parentheses, we can use the abbreviations for sample size, subsample size, mean, and standard deviation. Generally speaking, you want to report all numbers with two numbers after the decimal place. The exception is a p-value where you want to show three usually. There are times when you might want four, but generally most of the time three values is um, generally acceptable. The, uh, less your p-value is super tiny. If it's less than 0 0.001, then we would write it as less than 0, 0 0.001. So here's an example sentence that might be used to convey the results of a test. And so we could say something like a one sample z test showed that the difference in the quiz scores between our current sample and the hypothesized value was statistically significant. Now, I read it orally without all the numbers in the parentheses and at the end of the sentence. Um, your sentence should be able to flow without reading all of the values of numbers in parentheses or at the end of the sentence. If we are going to stuff sample size, mean, and standard deviation into a parentheses, that's where we use those abbreviation. N, capital N for the full sample size, little n for a subsample size, capital M for the mean, capital SD for the standard deviation. There is no period after those abbreviations. Um, there's no spaces between the S and the D, but all of those are italicized to denote that they're statistical values. Um, at the end of the sen sentence is where we put our test statistic and our p-value. Those are not stuffed in parentheses. They just are separated at the end of the sentence with a comma. The z and the p, again, are italicized. Notice all of these values, I'm using two numbers after the decimal place, except for sample size should be a whole number and have no decimal point because we can't have 9.01 for our sample size, and the p-value. Again, three numbers after that decimal place. Okay, so we're ready to go into example. This is an example that comes from a textbook that I used to use. Um, 
is pretty super simplified, but we'll go with it for our first example. Again, in real life, you're usually gonna run tests, not by hand, but with statistical software. Now, the book talked about this a little bit. Hypothesis testing or null hypothesis testing, significance testing, so null hypothesis significant testing, NHST, that is done most common um, procedure in research, end of sentence. However, one sample Z test is very rarely, almost never ran because real life is a little bit more complex. So to do a one sample Z test, you have to know the mean and the standard deviation of the population. And again, in the real world, we rarely know that. And so we end up doing something that is very closely related called a t-test, which we're going to get into next chapter. But again, we're starting off simple. In fact, this is so simplified that it, it doesn't happen in real life, but the procedure is the same. So we're going to start with the one sample z-test because we want to get used to that six-step process. So in this scenario, we have an earthquake that has hit a town. And as a researcher, we want to know, did the earthquake change the anxiety levels of the people in this town. On one hand, it might have increased their anxiety level because they've experienced this traumatic event. On another hand, they've experienced it, it's over, it's like how much worse can it get? Maybe their anxiety um, levels go down. Maybe they're just kind of washed out and they're the same after the earthquake. So this is the research question that a researcher has. So he goes to the town or she and gives a sample of people in this town a anxiety questionnaire any she they calculate the anxiety values for the people in, that they've chosen in their sample so the values are in green here 72 59 all the way up to 67 so these are in no particular order just the values of anxiety score for some people after this earthquake has happened on this anxiety scale now this scale was predetermined it had been used and validated and psychometrically evaluated to show that it's both reliable and precise and it's been norm referenced all these good things that apply to psychometrics so that it is a capital t score now in a prior chapter we learned that a capital s a t score has been norm scaled so that the mean is 500 with a standard deviation of 100 but a capital T score is always scored in a way so that 50 is the population average and 10 is the population standard deviation. It's usually a very well studied scale in order to ensure that this is true. So if in the general population we have a mean of 50 standard deviation of 10, then we would use, since that's the population, we'd use the Greek symbols mu and sigma for the population parameters. So our research question now is, does this sample of townsfolk show that their anxiety scores are different than the general population on a general day? So we're going to go through the six steps to run a hypothesis test. So I'm first going to, and we learned this in chapter four, the best way to get these right when we're doing p-values or probabilities under a normal curve is to draw the curve. So here I've drawn out a normal curve. Remember, it's the same thing we did in chapter four. The center is the, the population mean. So if we know the anxiety scores are a t-score, their mean is 50, their standard deviation is 10. Now, if I was to standardize that to a z-score in terms of standard deviation, the center is zero. This is what we did in chapter four. This applies to for each single individual or the collection of all single individuals in the world, the town, wherever. But now we know we have a sample. So from the population distribution, the central limit tells us about the population of all possible samples, or we call it the sampling distribution. The sampling distribution will have the same center as a population distribution, but a different spread. So let's go through our hypothesis. That's step one is to write our null and alternative hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is always that nothing is going on. There's no effect, there's no difference, there's nothing. The status quo is sometimes used. I like thinking of it as nothing going on. So if nothing is going on, then this town is gonna have the same mean as the general population which is 50. So our null hypothesis, we always write it with population parameter, which would be mu, 
not X bar. So mu, and it also always has to have an equality statement. So it's mu is equal to. So our null hypothesis is nothing's going on. The earthquake didn't do anything. The mean is still 50. And our alternative says something's going on. We can write three different kinds of alternatives. We could write that mu is not equal to 50, or we could write it that mu is now less than 50. That would be a lower or a left-hand tail test. Or we could write it as mu is greater than 50. That would be a right-hand or a right tail test. Now, because we're not giving any information yet, and to be conservative, we're gonna go with the two tail test. So when I write the null and alternative hypothesis, both of them have to have mu in them for the mean of the population of these townsfolks and the value 50. The null says nothing's going on, we're still equal to 50. The alternative says, we're no longer 50. So it's the not equal to sign. Again, you should never have X bar in your null or alternative hypothesis. The hypotheses are always about the population you're investigating. Now here we are investigating the population of town folk, not the population of the general public all over the United States. So if we go back to the assumptions, we have to assume that our sample was random. And we are not given any information except for it says that it's a random sample. So we're going to check on assumption number one. We have a random sample because we're going to assume that this is honest. Two, we have to assume that the standard deviation, the spread of anxiety scores in that town is the same as it is in the general population. That is an assumption we have to make. Um, there's no way to test that, but we do need to be upfront that that is an assumption on which the z-test is based. One, that we have a random sample, which is not that easy to do. And two, that our town has the same standard deviation as the general public, um, which may or may not be true, but it is a necessary assumption. So first step, write our null and alternative hypothesis. Now we know that our sampling distribution, if we have a population with mean mu, all the samples we take from it, the samples should have a sample average averaging around 50 as well. So I have my original distribution that I drew for single individuals in the population centered at 50. The sampling distribution or the distribution for all possible samples will also be centered at 50. Now this is the central limit theorem. Whatever the spread in the original population, here at sigma equals 50 or equals 10, the spread in our sampling distribution will be less. How much less? You take your sigma and you divide it by the square root of the sample size. Now, we are not given any other information here, so we are gonna default to using two tails and default to alpha 0.05. That's what you should do unless you have good reason to do otherwise. And we are going to talk a lot over the course of the semester and some today about using alpha 0.05 versus something else. Um, Two tails is pretty prevalent in most of your fields. So we're gonna go two tails. Um, kinesiology, they use probably of everyone and maybe a little behavior analysis. They, they are more tolerant of a one tail test. Okay. So even though the center of the original population distribution and the sampling distribution, although the centers are the same, the spreads are different. And this, this is the formula we learned with the central limit theorem in chapter four. Just barely. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Our sample is size ten. So to get the spread of the sampling distribution, that's sigma with a x bar on it, or we can also call it the standard error, that would be our original sigma of ten divided by square root of ten. Original ten was a sigma in the population, and dividing by the square root of ten because the sample size has a size of ten. Okay, so step one, null and alternative hypothesis. Step two, decide on your test statistic. We're going to do a z-test. That's all we know. Well, we're learning now. Alpha defaulting to 0.05, number of tails defaulting to two. Okay, so step three, you're going to get your simple random sample or your best representative sample and calculate the, or gather the data on it. Now, we gathered the data here on this slide and we have 10 anxiety numbers. We want to calculate the average of our sample to see if it's 
if it, prove is the wrong word, if it's evidence that we're still having a population average around 50, or if this is absurdly different than 50. Absurd as measured by the standard error and quantified with the p-value. So if I take all of these values and add them up and divide by 10, I'll get the sample average. So I did that with my calculator because I can't trust my mental math. I added up all 10 of those scores and I got 580 divided by 10 is 58. So our sample average is 58. 58 is bigger than 50. But alone, that's not evidence that the whole town has an average bigger than 50 yet. So again, the key here is, we will, whenever you take a sample, your sample average will be close to the population average, but probably not dead on. There is some uncertainty when you take a sample. Statistics is all about quantifying uncertainty. We never know the truth for sure, but we want to find enough evidence in the world of uncertainty. Kind of like when you are in court and you want evidence that someone's guilty a little bit of evidence? No, you need a lot of evidence. So 58 is bigger than 50. So it appears that definitely the sample has an average bigger than 50, but the inferential question says, if we could measure everyone in the town, would their average be bigger than 50? The sample we know is the population we want to generalize to. So we can definitely say the sample has an average bigger than 50. But can we say that the population of all these townspeople after the year earthquake have an average over 50? That's what the hypothesis test is about. So we've calculated our sample statistic. We know our population parameters. Now we need to decide on our rejection region. Now this is a step, this rejection region, that we do when we're calculating a test by hand. We usually don't do this when we're doing it in the calculator. We skip the step a little bit and we go right to the p-value. So step four and five are usually kind of combined when we do a test on a computer. But again, we usually don't do a one sample z test on the computer because we don't do them in real life. So most software actually doesn't have the capability of doing a one sample z test. So we're gonna have to do it by hand. As we move into t-test, ANOVA, regression, those are commonplace inferential methods and we will be doing those in the software. So hold on, we're almost done after this chapter. We're gonna move quickly away from hand calculations because I don't like them either. So the rejection region. The rejection region is based on the normal curve in the back of our book. Every stats book that I've ever seen pretty much has a normal table in the back because I don't like doing calculus on that nasty formula. So I'm gonna slip back a couple slides until we get to here. Okay, so this slide 17 is kind of helpful because it shows some critical values that are most co commonly used. So our most common alpha level is 5, 0.05, 5% false positive rate long-term. So if we're doing a two-tail test, our 0.05 has to be split equally into two tails. So on this panel A at the top of the slide, we have 0.025 in each of the tails. If you look up in your Z table so that your beyond Z area is 0.025, you will find out the Z score that goes with that is 1.96. And that's a number that probably ought to enter into your memory. Definitely, there's a very few numbers you need to memorize in this class or in statistics in general, but this is one that I would. If you're doing a Z, one sample Z test, a Z test with two tails, your critical values are positive and negative 1.96. Now, we kind of memorized this before. Remember the 68, 95, 99.8 rule? We said if you have a normal bell shaped distribution, if you go from the center, the mean, out plus or minus one standard deviation, you capture 68% of the area under the curve. If you go out two standard deviation on either side, you capture 95% of the area. Well, what's the inverse or what's left over if you have 95% in the center? If you have 95% in the center, you're left with 
a combined 5% for both the tails. Now in that rule, we say two standard deviations. Well, it turns out it's not exactly two. It rounds up to two, but the real value is 1.96. So if you go out 1.96 standard deviations on either side of the center, you capture 95% in the center, that leaves the 5% alpha on the tails combined. So again, if you're doing a z-test with two tails and alpha 0.05, your critical values are always going to be 1.96. On the bottom of this slide, we have a one-tail test. Now, if you have 95%, you only have 5% in one tail, so you've got to have 95% in the rest. If you look up the beyond z area in the table to be 0 0.05, you find out that the critical value is 1.65. So that's the second number I would memorize. So z-test, two tails, 5%, alpha 0.05, critical value is 1.96. One tail, alpha 0.05, critical value 1.65. Okay. So going back to our example. So our critical values, ah, that's kind of messy, I'm sorry. So if I've done the sampling distribution here for the sample average, the sample mean, your critical values are the cutoff where if your z-score is more, more extreme, you're going to reject the null hypothesis. So your rejection region are those tails. You, if On a two-tail test, you have two of them. It's totally symmetric. So that's why our z-scores underneath that I've circled in red are positive 1.96 and negative 1.96. If we calculate our test statistic, the z-score for our sample if it is bigger than 1.96 or less than 1.96, we are going to reject the null hypothesis because it's going to be an extreme or an absurdly, lar absurd, absurdly large or small value. If our sample gives us a test statistic in the middle, we fail to reject. Now, we're learning this with the Z test, but the same is true for a T test, an F test, a chi squared. Same process is true for all of them. So in step three, we calculated our sample average from our sample. In step five, we're going to calculate the test statistic for that sample average. So this is where we're going to calculate a z-score. And z-score always is the same way. We take our value, which in this case is sample average of 58, minus the, the expected value, that's our hypothesized mu equals 50, and divide by a number that's the spread. Since we have a sample, the spread we're going to divide by has to be the standard error, not just the plain standard deviation, because we have a sample with size 10. So the mean is always based on the null hypothesis. Notice that this curve that I've drawn on the slide has a center of mu equals 50. It is not centered at 58. The center for the distribution is always the null hypothesis value. Our sample average is not the center. It's going to be somewhere on either side of center. So our test statistic, we calculate the sample average was 58. We did that in step three. Our hypothesized average is 50, and now we need the standard error for spread. Again, we're going to do the spread in the population, which was 10, divided by square root of sample size, which was also 10 in this case. And we get a standard error of 3.167. Um, I would always say when you're doing these calculations by hand, always use four numbers at least after the decimal point. This one is 3.1670, so that's why it's not got that fourth number after the decimal place. So now we calculate our z-score. Our observed average of 58 minus our hypothesized average of 50 divided by our spread value of the standard error, 3.167. When we calculate that out, we get a z-score of 2.52. Now, I've only put it to two decimal places because when you look it up in the table, it only goes out to two decimal places. Now, on the side, I've drawn a new normal curve. So I have 50 in the center. If I go out 1.96 on either side, that's our critical value. Our test statistic is more extreme. It is beyond our critical value. It falls in our rejection region. It is absurdly large. So our p-value would be how large it is. Now, since our z-score is beyond the critical value of 1.96, it's much bigger, then our p-value 
the amount in the tails will be much smaller than our alpha of 0.05. Now, once upon a time, people just said less than 0.05 and called it a day. But nowadays, people are really stressing correct use of p-values and they will also, uh, you'll see things in journal articles about they want name and Pearson p-values. Basically, that means they want to see the decimal places, not just that it's less than 0.05. They want to know exactly how much smaller than 0.05 it is. And to do that, you would have to look up our z-score of 2.52 in the z-table. I'm not going to do that right now. We're going to jump right to the conclusion, though. We'll definitely do some more examples in class. So, conclusion. The conclusion is always in terms of the null hypothesis. That straw man nothing going on um, hypothesis we started with. So we started with nothing's going on after this earthquake, the average is still 50. But when we calculated our z-score, we find the z-score is bigger than our critical value, our cutoff of 1.96. So our data is absurdly large if the null hypothesis was true. If the town's average is really 50, it's very unlikely our sample would have an average that it's as high as 58. So our conclusion is that null hypothesis that nothing was going on doesn't look so great. So our conclusion technically is reject the null. If anyone ever writes reject the null on an assignment as your conclusion, it will be marked wrong. In fact, maybe I'll take more points off for that. You can never get away in a professional field saying your conclusion is reject the null. That doesn't tell us anything. Your conclusion must be written in terms of the things that you're studying. So our conclusion, although I've written out that the Z stat falls in the rejection region ever since, your conclusion must say something about anxiety scores after the earthquake. You've got to go back to who you're measuring and what you're measuring. You can't just say reject the null or fail to reject the null. So even though in quotes I put reject the null, that's, you can say that if you want to say that to yourself, but that is not the conclusion. The conclusion needs to be in context. And by that, you could say something like, after the earthquake, the townsfolk's anxiety levels are higher, or there's evidence they are higher than 50 on average. We're not guaranteeing that every person has an anxiety level of above 50, but there is evidence that as a town, the town's average is risen above 50. Again, I haven't put any of the stats number in this sentence, but I really want us to focus on what we are measuring on who we are measuring when you write your conclusion. Okay, well, let's watch a little value video. This is um, from Crash Course on Statistics on problems with p-values. So I've just shown you how to calculate, how to run a hypothesis test that, um, and in this prior one, the p-value is gonna be less than 0.05 because it's in the rejection region. But this whole process of doing a hypothesis test is, um, it has some pros and cons and there's some shortcomings to it and I want us to acknowledge them when we do a hypothesis test what that tells us and what it does not tell us so let's listen to this video Hi, I'm Adrian Hill and welcome back to Crash Course Statistics. To recap from last time, p-values tell us how rare something is. So far, we've been using that information to decide whether or not our hypotheses are reasonable and using p-values to reject or fail to reject an idea. Today, we're going to explore p-values a little more and talk about the logic of p-values and some of the problems that come up. Remember, to calculate a p-value, we first assume that the null distribution is the true distribution our sample was taken from. Then we calculate how often we'd see a value that is at least as extreme as our observed value. So in probability terms, the p-value is the probability of getting a sample as or more extreme than ours, given that the null hypothesis is true. So all the values that we see in the sampling distribution are means we could actually get if the null hypothesis was true. For example, 
let's say the average cat weighs 10 pounds or four and a half kilograms. We might wanna calculate the probability of getting a group of 30 randomly selected calico cats who have an average weight of 11 pounds or five kilograms if calico cats have the same average weight as the whole population of cats. The first issue is if in real life there's no connection between two things like fur color and weight, we still might get samples of calicos, mackerel tabbies, or tortoise shells that are different enough to cause us to reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference. Our alpha tells us how often this will happen. Let's say our hypothesis is that the reaction time of older professional chess players is different from the reaction time of the general population of professional chess players. Even if older chess players are the same as their colleagues, if we ran the study over and over and over, we'd expect that 5% of the time we'd mistakenly reject the null if it were true. This is one reason why p-values are pretty controversial in the statistical community right now. Not everyone agrees that a p-value less than 0.05 is sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. In fact, some studies that look at incredibly important things like new medications have already decided that an alpha of 0.05 isn't low enough. They want p-values lower than 0.01 so that if the null hypothesis is true, they'll only mistakenly reject it 1% of the time. Still others argue that 0.005 is the better cutoff. As you can see, the standard cutoff is arbitrary. Null hypothesis significance testing requires that we draw a line in the sand somewhere but it's not clear where. Arguments have been made that we can have different p-value cutoffs or alphas depending on the situation, and that scientists should be allowed to justify their reasons for picking a certain cutoff. But on the whole, many fields that regularly use p-values have some sort of official cutoff that they use. The second related issue is that a p-value tells you how extreme your data would be if you assume the null hypothesis is true. But when you really think about it, that's not what we wanna know. We wanna know whether the null is correct or at least probably correct. In other words, the probability of the null given that we've seen our data. A p-value of 0.02 in a study on cancer rates in mice tells you that if your new drug didn't work and there was no difference between the cancer rates of mice on and off the drug, then you'd only expect 2% of identically run studies to produce a difference in cancer cancer rates that's as or more extreme than the one you just observed. But we can't use these p-values alone to tell us about the probability of the null being true or false, even though it can be tempting to think we can. One common misinterpretation of a p-value is that it can tell you the probability that the null hypothesis is true. For example, if a random sample of tuna has a 10% higher mercury content than a random sample of mahi-mahi, it would be incorrect to say that a p-value of 0 0.02 in this case means there's only a 2% chance that the null hypothesis is true. This is an especially tempting misinterpretation because it feels like it maybe should be true. But again, when we calculate our p-value, we've already assumed for a moment that the null hypothesis is true and that any sample differences we see are actually just due to random sampling variation. If our p-value for the chess study was 0.01, that means that we already assumed older chess players were the same as the general population of chess players. So 0.01 can't tell us much about the probability that older chess players are the same as their colleagues. That would be like saying, assuming that the grass is green, what's the probability that the grass is green? It just doesn't make much sense. Similarly, p-values can't tell you the probability that you've made an error, given that you rejected the null. Again, this is because p-values don't tell you about the probability of the null being true or false. If you've rejected the null hypothesis, like that drinking orange juice is not associated with higher levels of cavities than drinking coffee, either you did so correctly because there really is a difference between cavities and OJ and coffee drinkers, or you did so mistakenly because there really is no discernible difference. But p-values, since they assume the null is true, don't tell you how likely either of those options is. Ronald Fisher, one of the first proponents of null hypothesis significant testing, wrote that, 
quote, in general, tests of significance are based on hypothetical probabilities calculated from their null hypotheses. They do not generally lead to any probability statements about the real world, but to a rational and well-defined measure of reluctance to the acceptance of the hypotheses they test. In other words, getting a p-value of 0 0.04 doesn't mean that there's a 4% chance the null hypothesis is true. The probability we want to know is the opposite conditional probability from what a p-value gives you. We want to know the probability of the null hypothesis given we got this data. But that's not what we get. From the p-value, we get the probability of the data given the null. For example, we calculate probability of data given older chess players are the same as the population of chess players, but we wish we could calculate probability of older chess players are the same as the population of chess players given the data. And while all the same pieces are there, they're not the same. This is made even more clear when you realize the probability of being a child given that you're at Chuck E. Cheese is not the same as the probability of being at Chuck E. Cheese given that you're a child. This is one reason why p-values are so perplexing. They don't don't give us the probability that we truly want. There are some statistical methods that will give you the probability of a hypothesis given the data. And we're going to talk about those a little later. A third issue is that if you reject the null, you still don't have much information about the alternative. When the data is pretty improbable under the null hypothesis, we reject the null and accept the hypothesis that the data came from another distribution that is not the null distribution. We call this the alternative distribution, and the hypothesis that goes with it gets called the alternative hypothesis. If we reject the null that Mrs. Smith and Mr. Kennedy give the same amount of homework each week, then the alternative is that they don't give the same amount each week. But we don't know whether the difference is 30 minutes, 25 minutes, 45 minutes. Or for example, we might want to know whether people who were primed with the words elderly, Florida, and retired walked more slowly than the average person who takes 10 minutes to go around our office building with a standard deviation of one minute. We think think people primed with those words will. We take a sample of 50 people, prime them, and set them off. Their mean time is 10.5 minutes, which corresponds to a p-value of 0 0.00036. We already decided beforehand to make our alpha, our predetermined cutoff, 0 0.005. So our p-value, which is less than 0 0.005, allows us to reject the null hypothesis. In this case, that people primed with words about being old take a mean of 10 minutes to walk around the building. But what now? While we've rejected the null hypothesis that the prime subjects take a mean of 10 minutes, the alternative hypothesis is just that their mean isn't 10. Our p-values can't tell us anything else. A fourth common issue for p-values is more about how we interpret non-significant p-values. If our p-value isn't lower than our predetermined cutoff, our alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Notice that we say fail to reject, not accept. Null hypothesis testing doesn't allow us to accept accept or provide evidence that the null is true. Instead, we've only failed to provide evidence that it's false. Consider this. Your best friend makes the statement there are no black swans in China. You think she's wrong, so you go to China and you look at a bunch of swans and none of them are black. You may at a certain point decide that you've seen so many swans that if there were black swans in China, it's unlikely that you wouldn't have seen one yet. But you can't prove there are no black swans until you've seen every single swan. Just like you can't prove the null is true, that there's no relationship between two variables, you can only show that you didn't find any evidence. It's false. But the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Failing to reject the null hypothesis doesn't mean that there isn't an effect or relationship. It just means we didn't get enough evidence to say there definitely is one. If we looked whether bees produce more honey when it's warm than when it's cold, we could look at some data and calculate a p-value of 0.25. Since we decided beforehand that our alpha would be 0 0.01, we failed to reject the null hypothesis that bees produce the same amount of honey in hot and cold seasons. But we can't conclude there is no difference, or even that it's unlikely that there's a difference. We can only conclude that we didn't find any evidence of one. Since null hypothesis significance testing is often the first type of statistical inference that people learn, it can seem pretty limiting to know that you can't provide any good evidence for the null hypothesis 
hypothesis being true. In some cases, the null hypothesis might be what you actually want to demonstrate. For example, say there are two groups, people who play a souped up bells and whistles version of a cognitive training game, and those who play a less fancy version of the game. If these two groups have the same amount of improvement in cognitive abilities, which is our null hypothesis, that's really interesting. It means that researchers could feel comfortable using whichever version of the game that they want. If playing the fancier, more aesthetically pleasing game made people with strokes or children with learning differences more likely to play it, researchers would know that that's fine. They wouldn't have any concerns that the bells and whistles would detract from the cognitive benefits. P-values can be perplexing, but they give us insight into how to make decisions about data. They also remind us that people's perception of evidence can be arbitrary. What you consider sufficient evidence might not be enough to convince someone else. When you read about the results of scientific studies, you can see the alpha they used and decide if you think it's a stringent enough criteria. More than that though, we now know what p-values are and how to interpret them. This helps us compare the logic of null hypothesis significance testing with how we normally reason about the world. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Crash Course Statistics. Okay, so p-values, they only tell us about whether the data is likely due to random chance because it was a sample. They don't tell us the chance the null is true. They don't tell us how big the effect size is, if the effect difference is has any real world implication. So p-values and significant tests are important. They're useful, but they're not the end all. Always, and we're gonna learn this not so much with z-test, but going forward with all other tests, after you decide that there is a statistically significant difference, we need to follow that up with how big of a difference it is. And that's the idea of an effect size. And that can be more useful for deciding once there is, we know there is a difference, is it relevant to the real world? So we might find out that a certain drug um, that lowers temperature, um, let's see, I'll read it word for word. A drug to lower temperature is found to re reproducibly lower patient temperatures by 0.4 degrees Celsius. And the p-value is definitely less than 0 0.001. But making, so it d definitely shows that this drug reduces temperature. It for sure reduces it, p less than 0.001, over and over. But the amount that it reduces it is by less than half a degree. And in the field, if we can't reduce the temperature by at least one degree, it's kind of worthless. So it's important to realize that just because we say we have a statistical significance, significantly difference, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have a practically significant difference. So practical significance deals with the size of a difference, where statistical significance deals with due to random chance or not. So I really like what she said at the end of the video that Lack of significance, absence of evidence, is not the evidence of an absence. So if we run a test, any kind of statistical test, and our p-value is bigger than our alpha, we say there's no evidence against the null, that doesn't mean necessarily that there's no effect. It just means that this particular sample was not able to document an effect. And this is where having sufficiently powered, big enough sample size matter, um, good enough or really precise measurement tools makes a difference, as well as having a very refined research question matters. And so we definitely want to work on replicability. So even if you fail to find an effect with one sample, that doesn't mean that somebody else won't find the effect. And this is where I really want to press that replicability can help us answer this question about if we have one test that fails to find significant, that's not the end. We need more studies. I mean, there's nothing that I can say more than reproduce, reproduce, um, replicate, replicate, do studies on the same thing. You know, one study the truth does not make. We need to have more evidence than just one study. Okay, so that leads right into our repl location crisis video. Hi, I'm Adrian Hill and welcome back to Crash Course Statistics. You might have heard that power posing affects how powerful you feel and can change hormone levels. If it does, we'd expect to see that effect over and over and over, study after study. And it would be pretty disappointing if one study concludes that eating carrots improves your vision, 
And then after you rush to sign up for monthly carrot deliveries, five similar studies find no evidence that munching carrots is good for your eyes. To make sure that an experimental result is sound, we want to replicate the findings. Results need to be confirmed, which is why replication, rerunning studies to confirm results, and reproducible analysis, the ability for other scientists to repeat the analyses you did on your data, are essential in science. Essential. These issues affect basically every field, from artificial intelligence research to social science. <laughs> A few years ago, scientists at a biotech company called Amgen decided to try to replicate more than 50 big deal cancer treatment studies. These were studies that had been published in respected journals. And the Amgen scientists were only able to replicate the original results 11% of the time. In another reproducibility study, a group of 270 scientists reran 100 psychology studies that had been published in 2008 in top notch journals. Fewer than half of the published results were replicated. Stanford researcher Dr. John Ioannidis has claimed that false findings may be the majority, or even the vast majority, of published research claims. The journal Nature published a survey a few years back and asked researchers if they thought there was a reproducibility crisis in science. 52% called it a significant crisis, another 38% called it a slight crisis, and 90% of researchers thinking that they have some size of crisis on their hands is a big deal. The replicability crisis has been used in political debates to undermine scientific research. Political activists, especially those that hold opinions that run counter to scientific research, have jumped on the problem of replicability as a way to discredit science more broadly. And when a medical study winds up with invalid conclusions, Researchers could head down the wrong path. People could get misguided treatments based on faulty conclusions. They could get sicker even. And a whole lot of money could be wasted researching and providing those treatments. So what's causing science's replication problem? There are a lot of answers. Some of them involve unscrupulous researchers, researchers that are more concerned with attention and publishing in splashy headlines than good science. Here we're talking about fraud, falsified data, intentional p-hacking, statistical evildoers. But many reasons scientific studies aren't replicable are less nefarious. One issue related to replication, redoing studies, is reproducibility of the analyses in a paper. There's not always one prescribed way of analyzing a data set. A researcher named Brian Nozick and his team invited 29 groups of researchers to analyze the same data set and attempt to answer whether or not soccer referees give more red cards to dark-skinned players than light-skinned ones. Seems simple enough. These researchers were all working with the same data, but they ran different tests. Some used linear regression, some went with Bayesian models. And it's not just the models that the researchers could have differed on. You could also have freedom to exclude outliers or look at different groups. 20 of the groups found a statistically significant relationship between skin color and red cards. Nine groups didn't. The point, says researchers, is that no one analysis is going to find the answer, the singular truth. When researchers aren't clear about how they analyze their data, from which data points they excluded to the exact model they ran, it can make it hard for someone to reproduce their results even if they had the same data. Good papers will have detailed descriptions of researchers' methods. When you replicate a study, you usually know what model the researcher used, or you can ask. But if scientists aren't clear or consistent about this, it just puts another roadblock in the way of good replication. There are other reasons for the replicability crisis. Some researchers and the folks who report on scientific research don't fully understand p-values. They make claims that statistical evidence doesn't support. Back in 2016, the American Statistical Association released a statement meant to help researchers understand and use p-values better. It was reportedly the first time the 170 plus year old organization made this type of explicit recommendations. Among the guidelines the Statistical Association published, scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. And a p-value or statistical significance does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result. P-values need to be understood in context. A significant result doesn't mean we ought to all rush out and change what we're doing. But if you like carrots, go ahead, keep eating them. <laughs>
Another reason science produces results that can't be reproduced is that published studies have a bias toward overestimating effects, in part because they were published because they had a low p-value. Some studies look promising and then aren't reproducible because they were based on a fluke. When the study is repeated, the fluke doesn't repeat itself. The website 538 offers up this explanation. Say you were looking at the relationship of height and college majors. You gather up your data, including a class of math majors with a few exceptionally tall kids and a class of philosophy majors with an unusually short student. When you compare the averages, haha, <laughs> look at that, math majors are taller than philosophy majors. You have statistically significant results. But when you repeat the study, those differences disappear. There's regression to the mean, which gives you a more accurate picture of pretty similar average heights of each major and nothing all that interesting to write about except a correction to your first paper. Small sample sizes also get blamed. The fewer subjects in a study, the more likely you get skewed and unreplicable results. DFTBAQ, my friends, even when your results make sense, DFTBAQ. So where can researchers start improving the process to help solve this reproducibility crisis? For one, researchers argue they need to do a whole lot more replication. Replication allows us to weed out false significant events, the flukes and the too good to be true effects that unfortunately make great headlines. We need to get rid of the idea that one significant test is solid proof of anything. It yeah. isn't. In fact, we need to get rid of the idea that one significant test is even great evidence of anything. But replication is expensive, and it's not as sexy as making a new discovery. It doesn't attract the same media attention, institutional acclaim, or funders. Who wants to say, I found the effect that my colleague found yesterday? So, say researchers, we gotta come up with ways to change those incentives. We need to find more funding for replication studies and change the way we all view the value of replication. Some people call for more publication of null results, those that don't support the hypothesis. This would allow quality research to be published even if it didn't show an effect, making p-hacking a little less enticing since you could still get null results published. Some researchers argue another way to help correct the reproducibility crisis is by reconsidering the standard p-value cutoff of 0 0.05 for statistical significance. Is it stringent enough? Should researchers move it? In 2017, a group of more than 70 researchers co-authored a paper calling for a change in the default p-value threshold from 0 0.05 to 0 0.005. They wrote, quote, this simple step would immediately improve the reproducibility of scientific research in many fields. Calling results with a p-value of less than 0 0.05 statistically significant, they argue, results in a high rate of false positives, even when that research is done correctly. Let's look at one area of research we've talked about before, social priming. The idea that certain actions or conditions can affect the way you behave. One famous case of social priming is a study where subjects who are exposed to words related to old age, like Florida, bingo, gray, or retired, walked more slowly after exposure than those who were shown neutral words. But recently, many researchers have expressed concerns that some of these social priming results may not hold up. When they began to see that, many experiments were done with many different priming mechanisms and outcome variables. And we're making this data up here. But let's say that of the thousand studies done, about 10% or 100 of them ended up with real effects of social priming. This is a table that displays how often our studies resulted in true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives. The top row shows the 900 studies where social priming didn't work. Because we used a threshold of 0.05, 5% of those 900 studies will still be statistically significant even though there was no effect. Those 45 are our false positives. That leaves 855 studies where social priming didn't work and we caught it. Those are our true negatives. The next row contains the 100 studies where social priming did work. In those studies, there were actual effects of social priming. There you can see our true positives and false negatives. So what does that mean? Well, remember, statistical power is the ability to detect we'll real there. effects. Sometimes we can fail to get a significant result even if an effect of a certain size is real. One estimate suggests that most psychology studies have an average of 60% power. So that 60 on our table represents the 60 studies that had a significant effect that was observed. The other 40 weren't caught, giving us false negatives. Using our table, we can look at the percent of significant results that come from studies with no effect.
are false alarms. Our false discovery rate is 45 divided by 105, or 42.9%. That means of all the significant effects that were recorded and published in our thought experiment, a bit less than half of them are false positive, which shows, as we mentioned before, that having a statistically significant effect doesn't make it real. All else being equal, if we had changed the p-value threshold from 0.05 to 0.005, we'd have way less false positives. To make the work of reproducibility easier, there are also pushes underway to encourage researchers to share their data more widely. In the United Kingdom, for example, many research funders expect researchers will make publicly funded research data available, recognizing the data as a public good. Academic journals also play a role in the conversation around reproducibility. Ability. Many of the most prestigious journals have adopted guidelines and policies that put more emphasis on reproducibility and transparency, in part to help boost public trust in science and the scientific process. Let's go back to power posing before we finish today. Really get that blood flowing. Confidence building. A study on power posing was published in Psychological Science back in 2010 that showed that power posing could change hormone levels and boost confidence. A TED talk about power posing was viewed more than 40 million times. Want to raise respect and awe from your friends and family and enemies? Power pose or not. After power posing went mainstream, other researchers tried to replicate the study with a larger sample and didn't come up with the same results. Other researchers found significant problems with the original study and came to the conclusion that, quote, the existing evidence is too weak to justify a search for moderators or to advocate for people to engage in power posing to better their lives. Power posing got labeled pseudoscience. And then in 2018, the original author published a response to some of the critiques about power posing with an analysis that suggested the poses could help people feel more confident and powerful. Now, the newest paper doesn't seem to address all of the critiques of the original power posing study, but it comes to the conclusion that researchers shouldn't give up research about the effects of power posing quite yet. No, no. These are not power poses, I'm just trying to find something that indicates confusion. This back and forth of the power posing debate does make it harder to know what's likely to be true, but it also shows the value of replication and even the reproducibility crisis in research. Science is a push and pull of ideas. Researchers are constantly iterating and expanding on ideas that came before. They refine results, build on other people's findings. Replication is an essential part of the path to scientific progress and real breakthroughs. The reproducibility crisis means more people are taking the replication step of the process seriously. Replication has helped us accomplish some pretty important things, like help change people's minds about whether smoking causes increases in lung cancer, even though researchers could never do a randomized controlled trial to determine causation. Evidence piled up, and now smoking rates are incredibly low. No single study is going to show us the way the world really is. But that study and the studies that follow it that do and don't find the same relationships are going to get us closer and closer. And one day, maybe, just maybe, we'll know with more explicit certainty whether or not we ought to be putting our hands on our hips and doing the Wonder Woman before a big job interview. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Crash Course Statistics is filmed in the chat. I think she does a great job, other than she's talking pretty darn fast. So um, I have taken a bunch, and this slide is packed full of things, so I'm going to read a lot of these. Um, these are from the APA Task Force on P-Values um, paper, and the citation will show up on the next slide. But I want to read this to you, because as we go into doing any statistical test, any inference with any P-Values, this is really good to keep in mind. And um, at the bottom, he says um, that the contents of the ASA's American Statistical Association statement and the reasoning are not new. Statisticians and scientists have been writing about this topic for decades. So none of this is new, but it sometimes gets lost in the weeds. So I'll start at the top and read this. So word for word, a good statistical practice is an essential component of good scientific practice. The statement observes and such practice emphasizes principles of a good study design and conduct, a variety of numerical and graphical summaries of data, understanding of the phenomenon under study, interpretation of the results in context, 
complete reporting and proper logical and quantitative understandings of what the data summaries mean. The p-value was never intended to be a substitute for scientific reasoning. Well-reasoned statistical arguments contain much more than the value of a single number. We're not going to rely just on a single number. And whether that number exceeds an arbitrary threshold. The ASA statement is intended to steer research in a post p equals 0.05 era. Over time, it appears that p-values have become a gatekeeper for whether work is publishable, or at least in some fields. Psychology, education, you know who you are. This apparent editorial bias leads to the file drawer effect in which research with statistically significant outcomes are much more likely to get published, while other work that might be, might as well be just as important scientifically is never seen in print. It also leads to practices called by such names as p-hacking and data dredging that emphasize the search for p-values over all other statistical and scientific reasoning. In light of the misuse of and misconceptions concerning p-value, the statement notes that statisticians often supplement or even replace p-values with other approaches. These methods include the emphasis on estimation over testing, so confidence intervals, such as confidence, credibility, or prediction intervals, Bayesian methods, alternative measurement evidence, such as likelihood ratio or Bayes factors, and other approaches such as decision theoretic modeling and false discovery rate. So we are going to learn how to use p-values and what p-values mean because they have use. They are useful. However, they are not the be-all, end-all, end of statement, and they should not be the only criteria on which we judge work. So there are six principles in the APA's tax force um, publication that they came down with. One, a p-value can indicate how incompatible data are with a specific model. So a p-value tells you how absurd or how ex extreme data is when compared to the null hypothesis. P-values do not measure the probability that the hypothesis is true or that the data were just due to random chance. This is the most misunderstood part about p-values, what p-values can say and what they cannot say. Scientific conclusions and business policy decisions should never be based only on a p-value, whether or not it's above or below any threshold. You can use alpha 0.05, alpha 0.01. That should not be the sole decision making for conclusions and policies. Proper inference always requires full reporting and transparency. So in the video, I made some notes. Um, the, the Nozak study where 28 different teams were given the identical data and they came up with different outcomes, that's because of differences in methods and outlier exclusion and doing subgroup analysis, all of these things. Anything that you do with your data should be fully transparently reported. And this is where I love R because we can knit our syntax file or our notebook and perfectly lay out every step that we do with our data. And then we can submit that as supplemental material. And almost all journals are coming to where they are happy to host supplemental material. We don't have to bog down the manuscript with all those details, but they are there for everyone to see exactly what we did. Were there data points we left out? Were there different decision-making points? And, because there always are, and we can report them fully. And then other people can judge whether or not they would do it the same or not, or what implications that might have on the outcomes. P-values or statistical tests, no matter how well we do them, do not measure the size or the importance of a result. So statistical significance tells us about incompatibility of our data with the null hypothesis. And if we say we have a statistical significant results, we should always follow that up with a measure of effect size and a conversation about whether that is an important, meaningful size of an effect in the realm of what you're talking about.
because by itself, a p-value does not provide good evidence regarding any model or hypothesis. Now, um, I have down here at the bottom the link to the Statistical Methods in Psychology Journal. Um, they had the um, guidelines and explanations that were um, published by Leland Wilkinson and the Task Force for Statistical Inference by the APA Board of Statistical Affairs. And this is, I mean, it was in 1999. It's not brand new, but this is um, becoming more and more of a big deal as we see these reports that only 11% of cancer treatment research is reproducible, less than 50%. I've seen some studies that say only 30% of psychology results are reproducible. That's a problem if we can't agree. And so these six things here are really good suggestions to start off. It's not outlying p-values, but treating them appropriately. Um, so some other bullet points. And again, you guys are just barely starting on your research career trajectories, who knows where you'll land, but I want you to keep in mind, always be completely transparent in your reporting. And that includes any data cleaning and data wrangling you do, as well as all your statistical analysis. Um, there's a very big push right now that some of the older fogies are having a tight grip on, but making de-identified de data open source, freely available. Um, some countries, if you receive funding from the public funding sources, you have to release your data. And this is something that in your lifetime, you're gonna see come, I think, light years in the next 10 years, you'll be required to release your data um, to some repository so that it can be reanalyzed and available for everyone to work with. So we wanna reduce our focus on new sexy headline findings and really zone in more on replication studies um, so that we aren't just hanging our hat on fluke so we can really be sure that these effects are real. And another way that's, you know, I'm always screaming is more statistical power comes from larger sample size. Um, samples are hard to get. I totally acknowledge that they're expensive, they're time consuming, but the only way to truly know is to have adequate or more than adequate sample size or to increase the sophistication of our statistical design or our statistical analyses. Um, a single t-test with a sample size 10 is not going to give us strong evidence either way, ever. So um, for reprodu reproducible publication bias, um, so interpreting p-values correctly, lowering the re reliance on only p-values and the strict 0.05 cutoff. Um, another, the last bullet here is something that's coming up more and more in the last, I've seen it come in the last three years, light years, moving forward, the idea of pre-registration process. So there's a lot of journals that are starting now. If you, before you gather your data, you write your plan, you write the first, your introduction and your method section of your article, what you plan to do, and then you leave off the results and the conclusion. And when you send that in to a pre-registration process, the journal, if you've done a good job, will say, yes, this looks like a great study, you've planned appropriately, your sample size looks good, we agree to publish this paper when you get done with it, regardless if your p-value is sexy, regardless if your effect size is big. They usually require that you have high power, which means a big sample size, and that you have some reproducibility built in to reproduce somebody else's results. But that takes away this gatekeeping of having a statistically significant sexy result in order to get something published. So all of these things are completely changing the landscape of research as we know it. And so your mentors, as you work with them, some of them may be more or less aware of these changes that are taking place. So we're going to wrap this up. We're already over an hour. Let's quickly go through. Well, I'll make a new video. I'll do a third one for the R. We'll stop here.